This is a CBS4 special report. It's definitely a challenging time. There's just a lot of anxiety and fear. Many members of our friends and family will get it. I came pretty close to dying. Encourage everybody to wear face coverings. Hand sanitizer everywhere. We wash our hands. We just cannot put people in jeopardy like this. The people need to see that light at the end of the tunnel. 2020, the year of the pandemic. Thank you for being with us. I'm Britt Marino. It is the light at the end of the tunnel that keeps us going in this unusual year, not just with the pandemic, but also racial injustice protests, the election and our wildfires. But we want to focus on just how we have come through the pandemic and what lies ahead. We'll start at the beginning, but we'll show you why that light is brighter than ever. The year started with stories trickling out of China about a dangerous new virus. We're very concerned about the potential for this becoming widespread in the United States. The first confirmed case in the United States came January 21st. Colorado has its first case of coronavirus. Then it came crashing into Colorado. We have learned of the first death in our state. That death was linked to a bridge center in Colorado Springs. But soon we learned of deaths across the state. A father, grandfather and husband. I just told him that I loved him. My dad was a, an amazing, humble, hardworking individual. He was the heart of the family. As families lost loved ones, governments took action with Denver issuing the first stay-at-home order. Drastic actions those grieving said we needed. Every time they go outside, they're risking infecting themselves. The state followed days later. There is a far greater enforcement authority in these matters, and his name is the Grim Reaper. I'm going to push this Q-tip out of the package. We saw our first test sites, but only for people with symptoms. We can hopefully provide low barrier, no cost testing. But the state ramped up, teaming up with Denver for a mass test site before moving to community sites. It's closer to our house. Schools went on spring break and did not come back in April. We want them to be learning but we're also trying to balance that this is stressful. May brought a mask mandate for Denver as stay at home orders were lifted, but large events were still off limits. Let's race. Some ignored the order. The county had asked for a temporary injunction. With the 4th of July bringing a spike, followed by a state mask order on July 17th. I do trust in the school. Districts around the state tried to go back to in-person learning. Overall community trend requires us to shift more of our staff and students into remote learning. But a spike in cases and positivity rates meant many students ended up back at home. The anger is not with our teachers. It's not with our principals, and it's frankly even not with our administrators. This is a societal problem. You know, we have prioritized the adults over the kids. Then came November with skyrocketing numbers of cases, hospitalizations, and positivity rates, and a plea to cancel social plans, including for the holidays. But we're tired, but now's the time to find that renewed energy to sprint. That sprint turned very personal for the governor when he was diagnosed with COVID-19 in November, along with the first gentleman. Both had mild symptoms initially for the first eight days, but then first gentleman Marlon Reese's symptoms worsened, and he spent a few days in the hospital. Our Karen Lee shares the early concerns tackling the pandemic from the very first days. For the health leaders, the worry started early. Dr. Eric Franz heads up the state health department. I was worried in January and February seeing what was happening in China. Bob McDonald is Denver's health director. Well, I think before we had our first case in Denver. And these men agree that this has brought unusual challenges. I don't know if I've ever seen anything spread as easily as this virus does. They say taking steps like stay at home orders are hard and felt risky when they started. We all feel very nervous about is it going to work? Is it even though I see cases going up? Is that just a leftover from a week ago? The key to reclaiming our lives working together and both men have a strong message about wearing those face coverings. I'm hopeful that, that people will recognize that wearing masks is um, an act of love for others. Face coverings are not just for the person wearing them. They are for everybody else. And so when a person doesn't wear a face covering, essentially what they're saying is, I don't care about anybody else. I don't care if I give it to you. I don't care if you get it from me and if you have a hard time with it. But there is no question the pandemic is taking an emotional toll. Everyone is 
uh, feeling taxed by this on a personal level. It's very challenging for us to go through this pandemic with the anxiety it causes, the, the sickness in friends and family, the death, the exhaustion. I think though we need to find ways to keep ourselves healthy and well. Focus on what you can do, be creative, think about new ways of engaging and recognize that it, it takes work. And I think about um, everybody else who's lost so much uh, during the pandemic, you know, people who've lost uh, loved ones, they've lost uh, jobs, uh, perhaps even their business. My thoughts are, are with all of those that have uh, suffered a great deal during this. Over and over, we have heard the key to returning to any sort of normal is a vaccine. Colorado has played a role in the race for a vaccine. So coming up, one volunteer explains why it is so important to participate. And Dr. Dave reflects on 2020, the year of the pandemic. Getting to the highest risk groups mid-December. This is a historical moment. So one, two, three, four. I feel it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah! I feel safer about coming home to my family at night after having this vaccine. Well, it's really exciting to see just the beginning of the end of the pandemic. We still have a long way to go, but this is so exciting to see a highly effective vaccine going into the arms, protecting Coloradans. The pandemic hit minority communities especially hard, so getting minorities into studies was key. In August, we met a man who believed it was his responsibility to join the UC Health Study, and we asked our health specialist, Kathy Walsh, to check back in with Michael Rouse. Michael Rouse works out three days a week at a gym, two days at home. His routine hasn't changed much during the coronavirus pandemic. Neither has his attitude. We're going to get through this, and we all have to do our parts to make sure we get through this. 66-year-old Michael has done just that. The retired computer professional enrolled in the clinical trial of a COVID-19 vaccine at UC Health. Back in August, he told us he was prompted, in part, by a call for people of color. The black community is getting hit extremely hard on this. And it's extremely important that older African Americans step up so that the younger African Americans can survive. UC Health is one of 89 research sites across the country in phase three trials of the Moderna vaccine. 217 people have been enrolled here. Michael got his first shot August 20th, his second September 17th. From his reactions, Michael is pretty sure he got the vaccine and not a placebo. Full body aches, muscle aches, chills, nausea, headache, and um, a little bit of diarrhea. And after that, I've been feeling great. If it's effective and safe, then it could be a game changer because... Dr. Thomas Campbell is the principal investigator for the study at UC Health. He understands why minorities are often reluctant to participate in research. There have been abuses in the past, what we would consider to be unethical uh, human experimentation. We can't get hung up in the past. I needed to show other African Americans and people of color that you have to have some faith in the system, you have to have some faith in our doctors, our scientists. Michael carries on normally, stays fit, and so far has been COVID free. He'll have his next blood draw and nasal swab in March of 2021, then every six months until August 2022. In all, it's a 25 month commitment. No regrets at all, none at all. Until those vaccines are widely available, we still need to make sure to wear masks. Now getting answers about masks and learning more about daily developments is now a little easier. We launched CBSN Denver. This is our 24 hour streaming service. And that's where we check in with medical editor, Dr. Dave Nida every week. We asked CBSN Denver's Mackenzie O'Keefe to get Dr. Dave's thoughts on how we made it through the year. Dr. Dave, this has been a really rough year and it started with a lot of confusion over the reports of the virus in China. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, I think at first, uh, a lot of the thinking was, well, this is something that's taking place in China. It's, uh, you know, across the ocean, it's really not gonna be a big deal for us. Then I think the realization sunk in that China doesn't exactly have a reputation as being the most transparent when it comes to the disclosure of things that are going on health-wise and the magnitude of what was going on at that time. Your next thought is, well, we've 
got all these pandemic mechanisms in place. So we should be okay. We've been planning for pandemics for uh, decades, uh, but unfortunately we learned that a lot of the pandemic programs had funding cuts, uh, had been dismantled. On both a personal and professional level, what was the hardest part? Yeah, I think a personal level, it's probably like everybody else. You know, you, you know that there are things going on, you see things that are going on and you worry about your family, you worry about your loved ones. And I, and, and I think that continues to right now. Uh, I think from a professional standpoint, the hardest thing has been the fact that it's ever changing and you get really nervous that you're not gonna be up to date on the latest or the new, newest information that's out there because we've learned so much from when this whole thing started. And I look at the advice and the things that I do today compared to what I was advising and doing back in April and so much of it is different. But then you accept the fact that that's the way medicine is, that's the way science is, and you need to be fluid and you need to be forever learning and adjusting. What would you say, what moment stays with you the most through all of this? It, it goes back a few months ago, uh, long day at the hospital, long day at the hospital, and seeing a lot of bad things going on and then leaving at the end of a day and going out and seeing a group of people gathered together, a large group of people, no masks, no social distancing, no nothing. And you go, then we do know the science behind how to make things better and how to prevent deaths. We've had too many deaths. We're gonna have many more deaths. How does life look going forward? I, I think in the big picture, I think it's all gonna be okay. I really do. I think that uh, we've got a long way to go. I think that there is a lot of dark times ahead, but I do think in the long run, we are going to win. And I do think that we are going to be able to somehow get back to a, a new place, a normal place where we can shake hands with people, we can hug people, we can hang out together, we can do things. So I think overall, the view is optimistic but on the other hand, the word that needs to go in to accompany that is patience. So how long will we need to be patient? Dr. Dave says he hopes we will find a new normal by late next year. Now, for many of us, normal includes enjoying sports with our families, but coronavirus even sidelined games. Coming up, our sports team looks at what's missing. The NBA abruptly postponed its season on March 11th, right in the middle of the Nuggets game. That's the same day the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. These revelations driving home how much our lives were about to change. And not even sports offers that same escape. Our Romy Bean and Ryan Green say there's just something missing. <laughs> You know, Romy, it's so weird to think that the home of the Broncos, the place that has seen 40 plus years of sellouts, hasn't seen a game day experience for like a year now, an actual game day experience. Like, I know that it's supposed to be empty right now, but even though it's not game day, it's still weird seeing it this empty. You've actually been to the games, is it still weird? It's still weird because honestly, on game day, it looks just like this. There's just no game day experience, that energy, that excitement. When we look at how the pandemic has changed sports, for me, the biggest thing with football has been how it has taken away the game day experience, more so than any other sport because Game day's a full day, it's Sunday, right? If you're gonna come and you're gonna tailgate and you're gonna barbecue, you gotta, you gotta check the whole day off. You don't have time to do anything else. The wildest part about all of this is how I actually kind of miss the stress of the games. If you remember last year during the Nuggets and the Avs playoff runs, mm -hmm. we were here like seven days a week. Playoffs at the Pepsi oh. Center tonight. Oh. Oh yeah, mm. I was ready for some playoff hockey right there. It was nuggets, abs, nuggets, abs. And during it, I'm sure even for the fans, it was like, oh, this is exhausting. You know, the ups and downs of all the winning and the losing. When we were watching the Nuggets and Abs do it this year, you were like, oh, I missed that grind. I missed being 
part of the playoffs, I miss the excitement of every goal counts. Every basket feels like it's gonna be the, you know, the game winner. That's, that was the wildest part to me is that the stressful part of the job still turned out to be the part like I really missed. But then also looking at it from a totally different perspective and having those moments when you go in the locker room afterwards and after a loss where it's so intense or after right. a win where it feels so great and getting that player, that raw reaction uh -huh. and then giving that to the fans, giving that to the people watching, it's it's all a part of it. It keeps you going. Even though it's exhausting, it's, I mean, it's incredible. It's like that's what we live for. To wrap this whole thing up, I think you'll agree with me on this one. The biggest difference between last year and sports now under the COVID blanket is that it actually just feels like a game and not an event. It felt like an event, you know, and, and I can't help but think of all the stadium workers that you interact with and, you know, what they're doing now, you know, the people you saw before you went on the field, the people working the concession stands, the people outside, like you were saying, out here. All those people are kind of the first people I actually start to think about when I think of the biggest differences between last year and this year. Win or lose, if you get to come here and you tailgate with all your friends yeah. and then at the end of the game, even though they lost, you know, guys in the concourse will be high-fiving each other. Oh, we'll get them next time, we'll get them next time. Sports is supposed to be shared with people. Yeah. And, and you don't get to. Nope. And that's what's tough. Ah, we miss it. No game day experience, no events. That's really a new normal. And that's also true for another favorite pastime, dining out. Our Dominic Garcia shows us how restaurants had to scramble to reinvent themselves. Honestly, it's terrifying. Terrifying for landmarks like My Brother's Bar and newer restaurants alike. Stay at home orders meant shifting from dine in to take out and delivery. We put a menu online and folks can order their food, backyard grill kits. And we're going to keep focusing on our to-go. It meant rethinking how to serve customers with limited indoor space by moving outside. From there, we really heard that there was a possibility to close down the streets and have retail move outside, have patios expanded, and really create an environment where people could spread out, social distance. A great plan for Colorado summers, but as the pandemic stretched on and days turned colder, it brought more adjustments like tents. Remember, this is Colorado. 30 degrees in the sunshine in the winter is gorgeous. Or maybe a yurt. We think it's just a very unique way to dine during the winter and um, they are heated, they are very sturdy. But getting through this year has taken a lot of nerve. Now's the time to be amazing and outrageous. One lesson we learned together even in a pandemic, life goes on. And we have plenty of proof just how full of love life can be, even in 2020. During the pandemic madness, we did see some moments of levity, like the dinosaur family taking advantage of having a museum all to themselves. The year has made families stronger, and that is certainly the case for our CBS4 family, where even in our socially distanced newsroom, we had plenty to celebrate, so we leave you now with these bundles of joy. In the depths of the pandemic, a buoy of cute kept us afloat at CBS4. On the day the president declared a national emergency, our son Weston was born Friday, March the 13th. At the height of the lockdown, Lila June Heiserling arrived April 16th. And shortly after, Paul James Clark on April 22nd. Thomas Marola, who's nicknamed Turk after his great-grandfather, was born July 3rd. At nine pounds, five ounces, Carson Payne Todd was born August 25th. Katarina Abeda came into the world on September 22nd. And breaking news, Grayson just learned about the newest addition to his family. He was hoping for a brother. What does that say? Brother? No. A sister! <laughs> Now he's excited to meet his baby sister, due February 22nd. The babies fill us with light in the shadow of the pandemic. Tell me what it's been like bringing little Lila home during this time. 2020 has obviously been like crazy for everybody and so much, so much insanity going on, but it's made 2020 a whole lot brighter and a whole lot happier and everything because we get, we get, we got hurt. What are you up to? The hard thing with COVID is it was just spreading so quickly. There wasn't enough data to know like how safe or unsafe we were. Initially, it was pretty scary. We have gratitude for the medical workers on the front line. The nurses made us feel so 
so safe. Many of the babies have not been able to meet friends or family because of COVID concerns. We couldn't see anybody and nobody could come visit us. Morning, sweetheart. You just automatically think that, yes, like my dad's gonna be there, my mom's gonna be there, but they are not able to. You have to take those precautions for, I mean, it's your baby, so you're gonna do everything you can for your baby. Good job, Weston. Between the naps, <laughs> coos, and giggles, <laughs> these babies are providing an adorable distraction from any worry. <laughs> And most importantly, loving on them gives us hope for the future.